everybody that's in the audience. Okay. Anyway, okay, it's called Florida or um, Board of Education meeting for November 29th, scheduled. Uh, purpose of this is to start discussing uh, kind of the financial picture of the district and what we see uh, looking out into the future a little bit. Uh, is Mrs. Rucker finishes her five-year forecast back in October. Uh, she's been working diligently to try to get a good picture on what is in store for the district. So we felt that this would be a good opportunity to have that discussion tonight so that the board is fully aware of some options that we that lie before us and to allow us to make some decisions moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. Rucker and I'm gonna let Mrs. Rucker in introduce our uh, guest uh, speaker tonight. Um, Mr. Moore has been working with us for years as far as, you know, even before I came to uh, Beaver Creek City Schools. And their company, uh, K-12 Business Consulting, has been creating Amongst other things, we know that we've worked with them to do the treasurer search and the superintendent search, but another uh, facet of their company, and to do our training, uh, but another facet of their company is they create five-year forecast models for treasurers around the state to use. So how many districts are you working with now? Uh, we work with over 100 school districts. Over 100 school districts that they work with right now. One of the things that is really nice about their model is um, they have a, um, what I would say, a, what a, an insurance. Like they ensure that when treasurers start utilizing their model, they have a oversight function in the tax base piece of it. So when you start looking at how schools collect their funds in the state tax dollars and in the, in the revenue and in the local tax dollars, there's a state funding piece and a local funding piece that they also help us and make sure um, that we are on track and we're utilizing the model properly and all of that. But one of the things that came up when we worked with Chris was some strategies on how to help our district move forward within the next 10 years and beyond. Well, um, Chris's experience, he's been a treasurer for 35, 40 years working in the business. And um, so having someone like that who has sat in the chair, understands forecasting, understands what audits we need from audits, understands having to sell levies and things to communities, understands all of the facets that we have to go through as a board, as a community, as a treasurer, as a superintendent, all of those pieces. Um, I just thought when he and I had had some sidebar conversations during our five-year forecasting, um, putting all that information together, we had some real good ideas about some unique levy types that we could utilize that would really work for our district long term. And so um, when we had those conversations, I went to Paul and said, Paul, I really think we really need to think about some of this. It's really going to set our district on a good path or continue us on a good path. I mean, we've already been, obviously, Chris will explain to you how we've already started down that path, but it will continue keeping us on a good plan and a good path for um, years and years to come. So, Chris, with, with all that, if I've left anything out, please add to it. But, you know, I want to build the credibility with Chris, especially people sitting around this table know him. You guys have been to OSBA. You guys understand that Chris has a presence and K-12 has a presence in the school community. But for our observing audience, it would just be nice to make sure we get the credibility factor there. 
I think Penny just said I'm old. <laughs> I am too. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I know I enjoy working with Beaver Creek because Penny said we work with you on your treasure search, your superintendent search, and uh, Kathy and Debbie uh, do goal setting and team building. Uh, but one of the things that we probably do the most work in the state of Ohio is on school finance. <coughs> so uh, I have uh, five CPAs on an MBA uh, working with us on the models, and uh, we work with about 100 school districts in the state. So. Um, and we help school districts uh, plan levies. We answer questions that, that people have about levy types, collections, and things like that. So um, we work with the largest school district in the state, Columbus, all the way down to uh, some of the smallest school districts, Strasburg, Franklin. So uh, regardless of size, um, as we say, when you see one school district, uh, you've seen just one school district because everybody has different dynamics. So uh, one of the things that uh, I talked to uh, Penny about uh, when we were looking at her last uh, couple of forecasts. Because I can see you've got a deficit that's now on the horizon in fiscal year 21. Um, you also have a couple of emergency levies that you have in the books. And if you had to come up with another new levy, uh, I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that it looks like the Beaver Creek City School District had a 20 mil strategy in place to get to the floor by using emergency levies. And it looks like it had been in place for a while. So didn't want to mess that up. You want to continue that strategy along. But there are now some new <coughs> tools out there called substitute emergency levies that you need to be aware of that were created in 08. So with that introduction, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and go through a few things here pretty quickly. Um, First of all, the uh, school district, you've probably seen this in October. This is from your uh, five-year forecast for October. And this is your revenue versus expenses uh, without a levy renewal. And there's a sign up here too, but I'm gonna go ahead and just work off of this screen here. But um, this takes a look at your revenue uh, with uh, three years of actual uh, and five years of uh, estimated uh, actual revenue expense in any cash. The blue line is your revenue, the red line is expenses, green line is your ending cash balance. Uh, your next levy to expire is a $10.4 million emergency levy that will expire on December 31st, 18. If that was taken out, you can see you have a slight dip in your revenue and your ending cash balance goes negative in 20. With the levy renewed, so we're going to assume that. And just so you know, that uh, levies in the state of Ohio, uh, when they are renewal levies, have about an 85 to 86% renewal passage rate. So it's fairly uh, certain that you can count on a levy being renewed once you have it on the books. So especially this levy. And this will be the first renewal of the 10.4 million uh, levy. That was your newest emergency levy that you passed in 2013. Okay. So it will be coming due for renewal. And if it passes, you'll notice that you still have a deficit that you're looking at in fiscal year 21. And that's why I said you're going to need to have some new levy, uh, at least to talk about that, or a combination of budget cuts and a new levy to get through 2021. And that's when I mentioned to Penny, you don't want to um, just pass any levy for that. If you've been on emergency levies to get to the 20 mil floor, you want to continue that. So uh, the one thing I would point out about a renewal of your emergency levy, even if you renew the levy, which 86% chance you're definitely going to be able to get that done, the revenue line still stays flat. The emergency levies that you're renewing now and you've been renewing don't provide you any additional dollars. So you have a lot of effort and campaign uh, angst going out there to renew levies that constantly are bringing you the same amount of money, okay? So that's something that we're gonna wanna look at because we have a better tool to work on that now. You won't just get uh, the same amount of money with some additional <coughs> emergency levies. So let's take a look at where your money comes from. Just as a reminder, this is FY17's estimate. 70% of your money comes from uh, local or local real estate, 
You have 2% from tangible tax. That's typically your public utility personal property. Um, and then uh, added together, it's about 76% 76, 76 of your revenue comes from local sources. The 24% comes from the state. It's the green bar, the red bar. But I will tell you, the slice that's green, that 7.9%, while that comes from the state, it's related to the purple section. In other words, that's rollback and homestead reimbursements from the state. So without your levies over here in the purple, you wouldn't have the green. So if you really want to look at that, they're tied together. So if you put that together, you know, your local sources being 76 and that percentage of your state being 8%, you know, you're, you're basically at about 84% of your money is coming from local and that piece of the state devoted to those levies. So the state of Ohio is really only helping your school district about that 16% that's called state foundation right there. And just a reminder, your district with a $1.7 billion tax base and with the wealth of this community is not on the high list for the ODE and the Ohio legislatures to help out in terms of new state money, all right? So, you're, so it's important for, I think the board knows, the staff knows, and the community knows that if your district needs to have additional dollars, it's going to have to come from local sources. Um, you know, you can wish for a lot of different things at the state in terms of new funding, and you can lobby for that, fight for that, and you should, and I know you do, but at the end of the day, the truth is, Beaver Creek is considered a wealthy community and a wealthy school district. So, not high on the target list to help out. All right. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about the rest of this evening, but I'm just going to tell you what it is up front. Uh, we want to work on a long-term long -term financial strategy for you. It's going to be a two-step process. First, we want to get you to the 20 mil floor. Second, we want to renew the emergency levies that you have now as substitute emergency levies. The benefit of that for the district and the taxpayers is you'll have some long-term stability and it will reduce your levy fatigue for the constant being on the ballot renewing these levies. It looks to me like Beaver Creek has been on a 20 mil floor strategy since at least the middle of the 1990s, but definitely in 2009, when you merged two emergency levies that you had into the $18.5 million emergency levy, and then passed the 2013 $10.4 million emergency levy. So it looks to me that in 2009, you knew you needed to get those two emergency levies into one so that you didn't have three emergency levies being renewed, okay? And you have a strategy of picking five years for your emergency levies, okay? So you can imagine that if you just constantly you know, needed to have a new levy and it was a five-year emergency levy, at some point, there'll be, you'll be on the ballot every year in a five-year cycle to renew these levies, okay? So I think in 2009, they recognized that, merged the two into one, then went ahead and sold another new emergency levy. So now you have two, and you'll need to have another new source of revenue to get through 2021 I think in your plan. So my suggestion, of course, would be that it's an emergency levy. But what do we do with these other two? All right. So you know, if you get to the 20 mil floor, all right. And first of all, you should know that uh, all non-emergency levies is typically called regular operating levies. Okay. They all count towards the 20 mil floor. So I want to talk just a minute about what's the 20 mil floor. Every single district in the state has to collect 20 mils of local property taxes in order to be eligible for state funding, okay? So what county auditors do in the state is when reappraisals occur every three years, there's reappraisal cycles in the state. You know, if this year was a full appraisal, three years from now would be an update, okay? So every three years, property is being reviewed to increase it based on market conditions. When that value goes up, regular operating levies that you have in place are rolled down. So if your property values go up by 10%, your regular operating levies go down by 10%. So taxpayers, their taxes they pay stays the same, unless you're at the 20 mil floor. If you're at the 20 mil floor because the county auditor 
is prohibited from rolling those regular levies below 20 mil. If your property values go up 10% and you're at 20 mil floor, you get an increase based on your 20 mils of that 10% increase. And this is what we call a 20 mil floor strategy. You want to try to get your regular operating levies to the 20 mil floor, okay? But it's very difficult to do that. Um, your district is wealthy like Dublin, Hillary, Morgan, Westerville, Upper Arlington. All of those districts, and I can specifically speak about Dublin because I was a treasurer there for 15 years, our effective tax rates were close to 40 mils. There was no way we were going to be ever, ever able to get to the 20 mil floor. You, here in just a minute, I'll show you, are very close to the 20 mil floor in, in where you're at. So you don't want to mess that scenario up. Because once you're at 20 mils, <coughs> you not only grow taxes every three years on a reappraisal and update, you also get 20 mils on new construction. Okay? So it would be additional growth in your local taxes without having to necessarily go back and, and pass levies and go through all of that angst. And you know, your taxpayer won't necessarily notice large increases because those aren't typically large increases on 20 mils. It's just a little bit of an increase every three years. So that's why you would want to be on a 20 mil floor. That's what's called a 20 mil floor strategy. And most districts that are on a 20, 20 mil floor and use that strategy have emergency levies just like you did. All right? And then we want you to renew your existing two emergency levies as substitute emergency levies for a continuing period of time. That's a new type of levy that was created in 08. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get there. But first of all, I want to make sure that we have some common levy characteristic language between us, okay? So I said there are regular operating levies and they roll back every time the value goes up, they roll back. Those are called fixed rate or what I would call common operating levies. Most levies you see school districts passing are common operating levies, okay? So they're subject to House Bill 920 that was passed in 1976 during a period of time that the state of Ohio had property values increasing 10, 15 percent a year, okay? Uh, if you recall, if you had money to invest in the 80s, you could buy a 13, 14 percent CD, okay? I happened to be in the business of doing that uh, with Talawanda City Schools back in those days. So that also meant real high inflation rates, okay? So um, House Bill 920 was put in place so when house values were going up rapidly, the tax rates would go down. Okay, so that taxpayers didn't get clobbered with these huge tax increases. All right, so that's fixed rate levies, all right? They won't grow with reappraisals and updates. They do count towards the 20 mil floor. Uh, they will provide new money on new construction. It's a misnomer, a lot of people think regular levies don't provide you any growth on new construction. Well, they do, okay? But they don't provide you any growth on the updates or reappraisals. The millage can never be more than the ballot language. So if you pass an operating levy, it's a traditional operating levy, it's 6.9 mils, and values go up, the 6.9 will come down. But in, in the last several years, especially in 08, 09, and 10, districts have passed levies, sometimes the tax, tax value went down. <coughs> it can never be more than the 6.9. So it can't go up above that, all right? So that means that if that scenario happened to you, a regular operating levy, while it can't go up, it may cost you additional dollars if your, if your tax base goes down. Okay? They can be renewed or approved for one to 10 years for a continuing period of time. Most districts in the state, if you're passing a regular operating levy, pass them to be continued. Okay? You have continuing levies on your books too. And I'll show you your entire tax base in a minute, but I'm going to talk about those that are fixed rate levies, and then I'll talk about your emergency levies. So the difference between a fixed rate levy and an emergency levy, or what I call a fixed sum levy, that's why when you talk about your emergency levies, you talk about the 18.5 million levy or the 10.4 million dollar levy. That's because it's easier to talk, to talk about them as the dollar amount they're going to generate because that's really what they are, a fixed sum levy. 
It won't go up. It won't go down. So if your tax, if your tax base goes up, the levy amount that it takes to generate the 10.4 million, for, set, for instance, would go down. If your tax base went down, like it did in many districts, for those 8, 9, 10, and 11, the millage rate went up. That's why districts that had emergency levies during that period of time, 08, 9, 10, and 11, actually fared better than districts that didn't because you continued to get a fixed amount of money regardless of what was happening to your tax base. That's a good attribute to emergency levy. They are not subject to House Bill 920. So when property values go up, they don't necessarily go down. It's just based on your total tax base. So they don't, they don't roll back like that. It does not count towards the 20 mil floor. Well, I'll show you in just a minute. That's important. So past emergency levies, which you've done, helps you get to the 20 mil floor. The fixed amount won't grow or shrink, as I mentioned, is a steady stream of revenue. They can be renewed, as you know, from one to 10 years. This district has selected five years for the renewal of the levies, and they cannot be continued. That's really important. You're always with the traditional emergency levy going to have to come back and renew it. It can't be continuing, okay? That was a negative, very negative thing about emergency levies. So here's your tax base. All right, so inside millage plus your fixed rate levies comes up with, I come up with subtotal. This is your gross millage rate right here, all right? So these are what I call regular operating levies, that 26.2 mils is a regular operating levy. Your inside millage is 4.6 mils. All right, so here we go with this terminology. What's inside millage? This is simple. In 1933, when the state of Ohio moved away from 15 mils of taxes, they said we will collect 10 mils, okay? They carved up a piece of that for every political jurisdiction in a taxing entity. Schools typically get between four and six mils of inside millage. The county typically gets one to two mils. A city usually gets somewhere around one. A township will get a half. And if you have a public library, they usually get a small piece. If you add them all together, it's 10 mils. Why is that called an inside millage? Well, it's because no matter what happens to your values, it can go up and down. It's not subject to House Bill 920. So the 10 mils is always 10 mils, okay? These fixed rate levies are sometimes called levies outside the 10 mil limit. You'll pass a tax budget this year in either December or January. If you look at the tax budget and still are awake after five minutes, um, you'll notice it has up there inside the 10 mil limit, outside the 10 mil limit, okay? That's, they're just distinguishing between outside the 10 mil limit that was voted on and the 4.6 inside 10 mil that was not voted. It was given to this district in probably 1933 and it hasn't changed since. All right, but for 20 mil floor calculations, all right, we then need to take a look at what the inside and the fixed rate levies add up to by class. Class of property. Class one, and I'll refer to it as class one, <coughs> is residential and agricultural property. That's all the property that you all pay for. If you had a farm, let's say you had 100 acres and you had a farmhouse on it, the farmhouse would be categorized <coughs> as residential. All the other property would be considered agricultural. But it's taxed at the same rates, okay? Right now, you have 4.6 mils inside. Doesn't matter what happens with reappraisals, they don't change. But you can tell over time, since these levies have been passed, your property values have gone up because the levies have gone down from 26.2 to 16.6, okay? In class two, or what we call commercial industrial, that would be uh, all the buildings that I drove by on the way here from the Forest Fair Mall. That would be the McDonald's, the restaurants on the corner, apartment complexes, hotels, uh, any industrial property that you have where there's manufacturing going on. You're not heavy in minerals, but if you had any kind of fracking operation going on, that would be a mineral value too. But um, again, you had rapid growth in that, I can tell, because 
at 26.2 voted mills, it's down to 15.61, even lower than Res Ag, which is very odd. So you've had a lot of commercial development in your district. I can tell from just looking at the levels. But if we add these up, you're at 21.26 mills, and you're almost at the 20 mil floor for class two, okay? So what gets you to the 20 mil floor? It will be either your 2017 reappraisal or the 2020. I would say it's a good chance that if your values go up by 2% for class two property in 2017 appraisal, you probably will be at the 20 mil floor for class two. I would say if your values go up by 2 to 3% to 17 for class one and pick up speed a little bit for the 2020 reappraisal, you probably will be at the 20 mil floor here in 2020, more than likely. Okay? That means that 20 mils of growth will happen for all your commercial, industrial, residential, agricultural value that's reappraised every three years and on any and all new construction. So you'll, you'll be able to collect some additional local property tax every year for new construction, every three years for reappraisal and update growth in your property taxes. Okay. The emergency levies, again, fixed sum, they're stated in terms of the amount of money or the fixed sum that they raise, 18.5 million and 10.4. The village is the same across all categories of taxes, whether it's gross, class one, class two. The 18.5 mil levy needs to be renewed in 2021, and the 10.4 is coming up in 2018. So your total gross operating millage is 47.74 mils that's been voted other than 4.6, and 38.2 class one, 37.16 for class two. Again, those two numbers are important because if you can get to the 20 mil floor, you would want to be at the 20 mil floor. And you're just on the cusp of doing that very thing. So whatever levy you want to look at to put on to get through 2021 for new revenue, you do not want to use a regular operating levy for that, okay? And that's the big message here. We want to take a look at that 18.5 and the 10.4 emergency levy when those come up for renewal to be a substitute emergency levy, all right? So let me talk a little bit about that. That's a new type of levy that was created by the legislature in 2008. Here's the killer. You have to have a regular emergency levy in order to substitute. You can't start by passing a substitute emergency levy as a new levy. So the new levy that we're talking about that you would need to pass to get through 2021, it can't start as a substitute emergency levy. It would need to be an emergency levy, like the ones you have now. But the two that you have now, the 18.5 and the 10.4, when those are up for renewal, I would strongly urge you to renew those as a substitute emergency levies, okay? It will not increase the taxes of your current taxpayers. In other words, what they're paying on those levies right now, if they're renewed as a substitute, would be the same amount of money they would be paying. They would not be paying more. Okay? It can be for a period. Um, all new taxpayers will pay the same tax rate, which provides the growth to the district. Okay, so the good thing about this um, is that. While it's not going to cost your current taxpayers anymore, the millage when your tax base expands because of new construction will not lower the millage rates for your current taxpayers. That means that the new folks that are coming in, new businesses, the, you've got several hundreds of houses that are on the right, they all will pay the same millage amount. That's new construction. So that gives you new revenue. All right, so. Unlike traditional emergency levies, these emergency levies will provide you local growth on the new construction and not cost your current taxpayers more money. Okay? The rates won't go up for them. All right? The other good thing is they can be for a period of one to ten years, like a traditional emergency levy, or 
unlike a traditional emergent levy, these can be continuing. I would also suggest that when you renew these levies, you renew them as substitute emergency levies for a continuing period of time. So you're not constantly <coughs> asking the community to prove emergency levies for the same amounts of money over and over again. Once they're continuing, you don't have to continue to ask for the same thing over and over again. Okay? That'll eliminate levy fatigue. Uh, it will not count towards your 20 mil floor. So proving these levies as substitute emergency levies won't mess with your 20 mil floor strategy. The current rollback in homestead credits that are associated with the $18.5 million emergency levy will adhere to the substitute emergency levy that you replace. So you don't use that reimbursement from the state. That's the 7.9% I was talking about. The 10.4 mil levy, million levy that comes up uh, next year, that doesn't get rolled back on it already because it was passed in 13. And if you remember the state passed a law that didn't allow or wasn't going to pay the 10 or the 2% rollback uh, reimbursement on that. All right, so these levies are going to, uh, they're growing right now rapidly. They're catching on in the state. You may not have heard of the substitute emergency levy, but they're catching on. So let me uh, ask for a little help to hand these out to, to give you a little information. So what we're handing out here is a couple of things. I just want to take a second to go over. <coughs> the top sheet, the, dis, the simple synopsis of what the traditional emergency property tax levy is. And then right below it, a substitute emergency property tax levy. And I have underlined the important points that I just made about growing on new construction. Uh, they can be for a continuing period of time. On the next page, you'll see, I just, it wasn't hard, you can, you can type this in yourself and look up uh, voters approved substitute emergency levies. This was in just this year, Delaware City Schools. They passed a substitute emergency levy by a 65 to 35% margin. I'd be willing to bet that the emergency levy that they had, that they renewed prior to this, was probably about the same percentage. And why not? It's not costing your current taxpayers any more money than what the regular emergency levy was. Okay. Um, again, next page, you have Westerville City Schools. So as levies, as traditional emergency levies come up for renewal, districts are more and more using the substitute emergency levy as their renewal vehicle. And again, why not? It doesn't cost more money. You can make them continuing and you get new construction. If there was a perfect property tax type, I think it probably is a substitute emergency levy. And you also get the continued fixed dollar amount. And so the 10.4 million levy you renew, not only will it grow for new construction, not only will it not cost your current taxpayers more money, but should we have an economic downturn like we had in 08, 9, 10, 11, the 10.4 million fixed sum is, it will, always, it will never go below that. So it provides <coughs> more for you. That's why I said, you know, when somebody asked me, you know, what do I think about these things? It's a, per it's a perfect property tax issue, okay, in, in my opinion. So, so that's why you need to take a look at that as a substitute emergency levy. Lots of good reasons for that. Here's your tax base. Just wanted to talk about that because we're going to start talking a little bit about uh, some scenarios with that. Before I go even further into this stuff and talk a little bit more about numbers, is there any questions about the things that we've talked about? 20 month floor, 20, 20 month floor strategy, substitute traditional. You know, Chris, one thing you said and when we were talking earlier that I think would be good for the board to hear is you made a comment about new construction moving in, about new construction creates growth, creates pressure for the district, and basically what we're at, we are asking those new individuals who are moving in to carry their fair share. Right. So, I mean, I just said it, but 
how you said it, I, I think it kind of resonates for someone who lived lives in the community would appreciate well, understanding that. In, uh, in 1994, <coughs> Dublin City School was the fastest growing school district in the state. We grew 900 students in one year, um, which was astounding. And I happen to have Greg Thompson here who is from Dublin City Schools, so he remembers some of this. Um, so uh, we were on the ballot every year. And we, uh, I work with, uh, used to be the Ohio company, it's now Fifth Third Securities, to come up with a concept that a lot of school districts use now called a no new millage bond issue. Um, and what we did with that, rather than asking for a bond issue every year, because we were at one point had two elementaries, middle school, high school, transportation complex, all in a five year period, we were, keep, we were losing track of how many times we were passing issues uh, or needing to be on the ballot. So what I did, uh, working with Fifth Thirds, we came up with a plan, instead of asking for individual bond issues, what if we asked for a $69.7 million bond issue, which about blew the board's mind when I asked them for that, this is back in the 90s, and said, but we won't sell that debt right up front. I'm not gonna run to the market and sell $67 million. I'll sell pieces of that debt over the next four and five years, okay? One bond issue, I'll make several sales of the issue based on our new construction that was coming each year. And what would benefit from that? That would be good because if I've got 600 new houses that are coming and a couple uh, new great big businesses that are coming, it's going to add $200 million to my tax base. I'll issue the debt then. That way, the millage amounts that we have, they continue to help pay that amount. Okay. So, and our community latched a hold of that very quickly because they all saw the new schools. They saw the new housing subdivisions. It's like, well, why are we paying for all of this growth over here that these folks are causing? Well, here's how we're gonna handle it. I'm selling pieces of debt as soon as their value comes on the tax rolls so that they can help pay. And it's helping to drag down that debt. So I think it worked really well there. We sold four new no new millage issues over about a 16 year period. Um, and they're still paying 8.61 mil of that. That's what it was in 1994. So um, it effectively spread the cost of the facilities over the, not only over the folks that were there there, but a good share of it to all the folks that were coming in and bringing it. So you have operating cost pressures uh, coming from the 2,400 new homes that you're going to have by having new students come in. This is really kind of the same thing. By not lowering the millage amount with the traditional uh, emergency levy, the substitute keeps that millage level the same for everybody, including all the new folks that are coming in, and you get that millage on the new construction. So it actually helps bring in the additional money that it's costing you to operate, and you know I think it's a good, in accounting, we call that a matching principle, your revenues and your expenses. So I, I think it's a, it's a good way to help spread that to the folks that are maybe not here yet, but would be happy to pay some additional dollars to be here. And no pun intended, they probably would have. That's why they selected the community. So, okay, you're very heavy residential. And you got a bunch more coming, okay? So uh, I would say that that this type of strategy, I think, would work very well. I think it would it would probably ring well. I would think to the folks that are voting on these substitute levies to renew them, uh, that they understand that these other folks that aren't here yet are going to pay their share. So let me give you a scenario. This is a scenario of an example between a traditional emergency levy and a substitute emergency levy. So we're going to use the 10.4 million dollar renewal. <coughs> that's coming up of your emergency levy. Right now it's at 6.09 mils. So let's just say that that needs to be up for renewal in May of 17, which I think would be a wise timing to put that on the ballot. Uh, let's say your current AV is 1.7 billion, and let's just use what would happen with 3% new construction, or $51 million of assessed value. With a traditional emergency levy, that 51 million is just simply added on to the 1.7 billion. The fixed sum amount of 10.4 million stays the same. 
So what happens is, with that additional $51 million, you go from 6.09 mils, where it is now, down to 5.91. That would not only slightly give current taxpayers a slight reduction, but it would also reduce the millage for these new people that were just coming in. So they didn't really, they aren't really necessarily paying their share of where it would have been. That's a 0.18 mil reduction. So per $100,000 of fair market, that would be about $5.15 a year or 43 uh, cents a month in reduction of tax bills that a current taxpayer would see. <clears throat> so again, it's an insignificant amount. Um, and I would, if it were me, I'd rather go ahead and pay what I'm currently paying, the 6.09, forego the 43 cents a month boost I would get in my, uh, my take-home pay and have these folks pay a fair share uh, into our district. With a substitute at 51 million in new construction, it comes on the books. The millage stays the same, 6.09, and the folks that are coming in, you pick up $310,000 annually of new revenue from the construction of the new homes, new businesses. All right. And again, I want to note that increase is only on new construction. It's not on reappraisal or update growth. These substitute levies treat people fairly. <clears throat> if the value goes up because of that, your tax rate will go down um, for that. But new construction, you'll collect. 20 mil floor growth. Um, even with the renewals that we're talking about of the traditional emergency levies, um, you're going to need to have some new revenue source to get through 2021. Again, I think I pointed out that would probably be something you'd want to look at putting on the ballot in May of 2018. You're open that year. You don't have another re renewal on that year. So this would maybe be a good time to have a new money uh, issue on. It needs to be a traditional emergency levy so that you don't mess up the 20 mil floor strategy that you have. Um, and you can make that be a five year duration so that when that comes up for renewal again in May of 23, then I would make that emergency levy, a substitute emergency levy, at that point in time, 2023, if you follow our strategy with this, you have no more renewal levies that you need to renew at that point. You're out from underneath that overhang, okay? All right, so that would require you to renew the 18.5 mil levy uh, when it comes up. 2020 as a substitute. So again, by 2023, uh, Beaver Creek could be uh, emergency levy renewal free. Okay, and you would have growing emergency levies because they're substitutes. Okay. All right, the 20 mills that provide not only growth on new construction but also inflationary growth on reappraisal and updates every three years. That would be in play by 2023. It probably will be in place sooner. Okay, depending on your property value growth, okay? 2023 would be the latest that, that would be in effect because I know what's happened to your tax base. I'm gonna show you here in a second. So uh, by, by 2023, everything you have in terms of a property tax issue would be growing. So that's what we're trying to unleash here by this strategy. So, uh, you know, your district may not need new levies going forward. Um, by simply watching your expenses, and if you had modest local assessed valuation growth, okay? I can't say you will never, but I know if you follow the strategy, you're gonna put yourself in the best position possible to not be asking for more money than you actually need. So, let me recap the timeline. In order that things will happen, you have a $10.4 million emergency levy that's gonna expire December 3118. That should be renewed as a substitute emergency levy in May of 2017 on a continuing basis. You will need, and again, don't get shocked at this number, but I tried to come up with, if you had to have a new emergency levy, what would be the dollar figure it would need to, to, to raise so that it would get you to 2023 so if it was renewed as a substitute, you wouldn't have to have another levy, okay? And that was a 15.3 million emergency levy. It needed to be traditional. It would need to be offered May of 2018.
had to get you through fiscal year 24 based on your current operating parameters with no budgetary reductions. Um, and again, when that comes up for renewal in 2023, you would renew it as a substitute emergency levy too. All right. And then your 18.5 million emergency levy expires December 31, 21. Renew that as a substitute emergency levy in May of 2020. At this point, again, all of your levies would be, these would all be growing based on new construction, and your 20 mills would be growing on new construction and reappraisal growth every three years. And again, I, I picked this number just because I was trying to get, if you passed a new levy in May of 2018, what would it take to get you to 2024 at your current operating parameters with no budget reductions or anything? That is not being decided this evening. It's just a number I know would get you there, okay? There's uh, just a few sheets here I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about, and that is just to let you know that um, this is a reappraisal and update cycle in the state, and you can see that in 2017, Green and Montgomery County, and you have value in both of those, will have a uh, update, okay? So in an update, they take a look at uh, sales, uh, values, see if they've been increasing, and then they combine and adjust uh, houses usually by neighborhood. It's pretty refined these days. So values will go up in 17 to be collected in 18. Then if you look over in 2020, I highlighted that Green and Montgomery will come up for a complete reappraisal. That they do a little bit more in-depth work. Uh, it's still an appraisal, but a little bit more involved. Um, so again, we would typically see values increase for tax year 20 and collected in 2021. Let's turn the page. This is the sales data that the Department of Taxation in the state of Ohio keeps. This is your history. Let me explain what I have in the box over there for you. And we went right through the great housing bubble this information. So you'll see I've got boxed in 2008 and 2013. That's how long it took for the values to flush through the system that we have. All right. So on the right hand side, you'll see the median market to price ratio. All right. What that means is the county auditors around the state of Ohio with guidance from the Ohio Department of Taxation tries to appraise your house to within 92 to 94 percent of what it could be sold at an arm's length transaction. Okay, so if you see the percentages over there, let's take a look at well, 2008. Well, actually, it's 2009 was uh, the worst, where it's at 99.77 percent. What it's saying is the county auditor had houses, homes valued too high. If they were valued lower then based on actual sales data, the percentage would have been lower. So what happened at your school district during this reappraisal cycle back then is your values were lower, okay? That happened statewide, okay? Some districts were literally hammered. Their values went down 10, 12% for residential and maybe five, 10% for commercial. All right, yours didn't go down quite that much, but I think it was around two to 3% that they went down. My, my recollection is right. But everybody in Green County went down. Yours probably went down a little less than most. Okay, but it went down. But you see what's happening in 2014. The number of home sales jumped to 1,130 from 491 the year before. The median sales price rose from 167,000 to 170, and all of a sudden, that reappraisal to market ratio is at 92.5%. That's the first year of this next 2017 reappraisal cycle. What do you think 2015 is going to look like? That's right. It's going to, that ratio is probably going to dip into maybe 89%. And then another year, maybe 88. What's that signaling to the county auditor? I got to raise values because I got to stay between that 92, 94. All right, so there's, there's price increase pressures on homes. Paul, you said you're buying a new home. Right. Right. <laughs> I hear the inventory. Yeah, I, I hear the inventory is not quite as uh, yeah, it's, not. it's not robust, is it? No. Yeah. It hasn't been for yeah, a while. Well, 
struggle. That's right. And part of the reason is, is that in 08, 9, 10, 11, Gene, you and I were talking about this before. Even though you may want to expand the supply of houses, a lot of people that had those skills and trades did something else, and they haven't all migrated back into the, in other words, the supply and demand economics of our country, they're not perfect. It takes time for things to adjust. It's the same thing in, uh, in, in central Ohio. The inventory is as bad as some of the realtors I know personally have seen in their lifetime. They just, they can't build stuff fast enough. And uh, they're selling houses before they even get on the market. Absolutely. Here. Sure, I believe that 100% for sure. All right, so bottom line is, the reason we're talking about it, we all see it, is I'm gonna start talking about the estimated increases in new construction and the increases in your reappraisal and updates that I'm gonna build into the next two or three scenarios for you, okay? But I didn't want, I wanted you to feel that they're not unreasonable, okay? On the next page, final page, if I just took a look at 2016 information from Zillow, for Beaver Creek, it says the, the average home value is 174,600. That was up 3.7% year over year. And they're projecting that the forecast will be a 2.9% year over year increase. If that's on a three year <coughs> reappraisal cycle times three, that's 8.7%. And if that $174,000 needs to be means tested, take a look at what happened two years earlier with the county auditor's own number, it was 107. It's on the mark. The Zillow number at 174 is pretty close to being on the mark, okay? So, uh, so I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna give you a handout here and talk about what some of those scenarios are I don't have any scenario that shows residential agricultural going up by more than 5% in any three-year period. Even though I just showed you, it could be easily almost 9%, okay? And some of them are as low as three, okay? So I've tried not to overblow the concept of the, of the finances I'm trying to show you. In other words, I'm trying to show you numbers for sure you would hit and maybe do better, okay? So, so, pass those. So, I've got three scenarios because if I were sitting in your shoes, I would say, okay, we just sat through all this stuff that we just talked about, but what, what, what does it all mean? Okay, how can you help me understand it a little bit more? So, I'm going to try to do that. All right, these three sheets are all the same, except some of the numbers have changed. So the layout is the same, so you don't have to get used to any format. So I'm going to explain a little bit more in depth on page one. But page two and three, the formatting is basically the same, just different numbers. All right, so top, all right, on page one, uh, over here on the left-hand side, in the yellow box at the top, are some key assumptions. Okay, so this is kind of your baseline. In other words, this is exactly where you're at right now. Uh, we need to renew the upcoming two levies. I've estimated 2.7% reappraisal growth and 19.5 million in new construction. When I say 2.7% reappraisal growth, that's for 2017, <coughs> 2020, 2023, and 2026. I am clearly being very conservative, okay? I'm not trying to you know, blow this all up and make it look grander than it is. I can almost guarantee it will be better than I'm showing you, but it's, I, I don't want to, I don't want you to be misled by anything. I don't do that kind of stuff. All right. Um, renewing the emergency levies for five years as per history. In other words, this scenario shows emergency levies being renewed for five years, traditional emergency levy, no new construction growth. So I'm just showing you your normal operating parameter here. All right, uh, and then I'm adding a new emergency levy in May of 18 that gets you through 2026 at a positive ending cash balance, okay? 
I'm not trying to decide whether you need two, three, I'm just saying what levy would it take to get you to 2026, which is our 10 year planning horizon, okay? And then the final thing is, with you doing, or me modeling in this scenario, the same operating things that you've been doing, renewing levies every five years, this would mean that you would have to renew levies again in May of 2019, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 26. You'd be on battle all the time. <laughs> So, and, and that was what I circled up above these years, all these years, there's constantly renewals, okay? Again, for no more money. All right, about a third of the way, uh, well, right here on this sheet, this is easier for me to point, if you see a little gold star, I just punched a number in and said, if we offer a levy <coughs> in May of 18 to first be collected in calendar year 19, it would take an 11.6 mil levy to get a positive ending cash balance, which I have represented by the red arrow right here. And you'll see that's just a little above $1 million. Now that's not as much ending cash balance that you should have, but it's positive. So I was just trying to get you to a positive point. What would it take? Operating at your current level, renewing the traditional emergency levies over and over, okay, would be 11.6 mils would be needed. Not, I'm not saying in one shot, I'm not saying in two shots, three, I'm not deciding what that would be, it would just be this much money. Scenario two, yellow box. I'm still using the exact same overall growth information, 2.7%, new construction, 19.5 million, this time, however, we would be renewing the 10.4 mil <coughs> million emergency levy as a substitute in May of 18. We would be renewing the 18.5 million emergency levy as a substitute emergency levy in May of 2020. The new emergency levy 2018, I haven't factored that in, okay? Um, I'm estimating at 2.7% that <coughs> the uh, you would be at the 20 mil floor for class one in 2023, not 2020, again, because it's so conservative. I'm estimating that you would be at the 20 mil floor for class two in 2020. Again, really conservative property assessed value increase estimates. All right, right now, if you looked at the gold star, you would see that that's an 11 mil levy, not 11.6. You'll also see a whole lot fewer red circles at the top of the sheet for renewals because once you renew a levy as a substitute, you don't have to renew it again. As we're suggesting as we continue. At the very bottom, you'll see a new set of numbers and you'll notice the red arrow, it's positive at a million, just a little over a million bucks, just about like scenario one. You'll see a new number at the bottom that says 7.750,000. So if we just did these renewals as emergency, substitute emergency levies that grow, and you hit the 20 mil floor in 2023 for class one and 2020 in class two, you would generate $8 million more just using the same economic growth scenarios that you currently have in the forecast. So that trimmed from 11.6 to 11 the amount of levy millage you would need over this 10-year period for new levies. With that in mind, scenario three. Scenario three, that yellow box is a little bit more beefed up. Gee whiz, I went all the way to reappraisal growth of 4%. And I just showed you it could be double that, but I went all the way to 4%. This is as aggressive as I would be, okay, for planning. So we want to make sure that you get this, all right? And you get what we project. New construction growth, 20.5 million instead of 19.5. Again, not really going too far out there, but knowing that you got over 2,000 new houses that are planned to be built here, probably in less than the next 10 years. So this is what, what uh, and your average home, if you really looked at Zillow, the new homes, your average is about 400,000, okay? hundred of those every year is basically, you know, what's that, 40 million? Well, 40 million's taxable value is approximately uh, 13 and a 
half a million, I've only estimated 12 million of new construction. So again, I guarantee you're going to get this, okay? All right, well, sort of guarantee you. But, um, so we'll, again, renew the 10.4 million emergency levies as substitute in May of 17, renew the 18.5 million as substitute in May of 20. Uh, did not factor in what you would do in May of 2018, but do note you still do need to do something. With these economic growths, you hit the 20 mil floor for class one in 2020 instead of 2023. You hit the 20 mil floor for class two in 2017 instead of 2020. Now let's take a look at the gold star. Now it's 10 mils. It went from 11.6 to 10. And if you look at the red arrow again, we're at a million 43 positive, just about the same as the last two. But if you look at the bottom, you've raised $21.8 million more money off just renewing the same levies, getting to the 20 mil floor. And then you can decide with 10 mils, do you put a 6.9 mil levy forward in May of 18, get to 2023, renew it as a traditional, see where you're at, if the economic data has gotten much better than what I've projected, which it should, maybe you don't need to pass another levy. Maybe with some budget adjustments along the way, you get through 2026, maybe you get through a lot further, but you're done renewing levies at that point. 